On the 24th of February 2022, Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin announced what he called a special military operation to denazify their neighbor. The attack has been considered the largest on European soil since World War II, triggering the largest refugee crisis on the continent since then, with over 3.7 million Ukrainians reportedly escaping the conflict. The leadership of the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has garnered him international acclaim, turning him into a symbol of Ukrainian heroism. But let us take a step back further than the 21st century, further than Putin and Zelensky, further than NATO and Russia, but back to the beginnings of Russia and Ukraine, in order to have a deeper look at what could have caused this conflict. We return to the 9th century Kievan Rus. That kingdom was the first Eastern Slavic state, first united by the ruler Prince Alec back in 879. It was a mixture of Slavic, Baltic, and Finnic tribes. Its capital, Kiev, is now Ukraine's capital. That's where Belarus and Russia got their name. The most popular theory for the origin of the name Ukraine states that it came from the Slavic word for borderland, primarily referring to the Kievan Rus border territories. Volodymyr is a Ukrainian given name of East Slavic origin. Vladimir is a Russian equivalent. Both mean ruler of the world or ruler of peace. As fate would have it, these are the names of the current presidents of Ukraine and Russia respectively. And it seems that one is fighting to be treated as the ruler of peace and the other as the ruler of the world. Both countries draw their culture, language, and their lineage through Kievan Rus. Today, the modern nations of Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine claim the state as their cultural ancestors. This thousand-year-old connection is the origin of the present conflict in the region. For more than a millennium, Ukraine found itself as the battleground of competing powers. It was constantly pulled from left to right by the West and Russia. Ukraine did not exist then as an independent sovereign state. The name Ukraine then only signified the territory around Kiev. The Mongols sacked Kievan Rus in the year 1237 and established the state of Golden Horde in 1242. Poland and Lithuania vied for power in the region through the succeeding centuries, pushing out the Mongol invaders. The Cossacks, most closely connected with the Kiev and Ukraine, signed their allegiance to the Tsar of Russia through the Pereyaslav Agreement in 1654 to resist the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The 17th century witnessed a war between the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Tsardom of Russia. Lands to the east of the Dnieper River fell under Russian imperial control, earning the name left bank Ukraine. To the west of the Dnieper or the right bank fell under Poland. Sweden invaded Russia on the 1st of January 1708. The Battle of Poltava in Ukraine a year later on the 8th of July 1709 ended with the victory of Tsar Peter I against the Swedish Empire. The Russian Empire took over as the dominant power, marking the battle as crucial importance in the history of Russia and Ukraine. It was around this time when Ukraine began to explicitly face the influence of Russia through Russification. The actions committed by Imperial Russia, then the Soviet Union, and later modern-day Russia to strengthen their hold on their neighbors such as Ukraine. Absolute power. A few months after Catherine the Great's coronation back on the 22nd of September 1762, the scribe Simeon Divovich wrote a poem entitled A Conversation Between Great Russia and Little Russia. Do you know with whom you are speaking or have you forgotten? I am Russia after all. Do you ignore me? I know you are Russia. That is my name as well. Why do you intimidate me? I myself am trying to put on a brave face. I did not submit to you but to your sovereign. Under whose auspices you were born of your ancestors? Do not think that you are my master. Your sovereign and mine is our common ruler. Little Russia is of course Ukraine. Belarusians were also Little Russians, while Great Russia is Russia. It seems that this conversation has been going on repeat for centuries. Kirill Razumovsky, the hetman or the head of state of the Hetmanate, the autonomous Cossack state, supported the coup against Tsar Peter III for the ascension of his wife, Catherine the Great. I loved you. And you feel this has affected that love detrimentally? 
The fact you're trying to kill me, indeed, it has cast a pall. Many in the Hetmanut were optimistic about her rule, but they would soon realize that she had other plans, as this poem alluded to. In 1764, Catherine removed Razumovsky as Hetman, before abolishing the office of Hetman entirely. She wrote to the Prosecutor General of the Senate, the de facto chief of Catherine's political police, Prince Alexander Vazemsky, when the Hetmans are gone from Little Russia, every effort should be made to eradicate from memory the period and the Hetmans let alone promote anyone to that office. Russia's intentions of imperialism were clear. I have a vision for Russia. Let me have it. The Crimean Khanate succeeded the Golden Horde, then a part of the Ottoman Empire. Victories against that empire allowed Catherine to absorb present-day southern Ukraine, founding new cities such as the famous Odessa. The Treaty of Kachuk Kainarja, signed back on the 21st of July 1774, turned Crimea into a protectorate of Russia. The direction was initially for the eventual independence of Crimea, but in 1783, Catherine ultimately annexed it. That region would be passed around between Great and Little Russia for the next centuries. I will not share my throne with anyone. In December 1792, Catherine decided in favor of the second of three partitions of Poland that sought to end the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. She wrote, Deliver the lands and towns that once belonged to Russia from the corruption and oppression with which they are threatened. In April 1794, Catherine forcibly converted the Uniates, followers of a historical church that originated within the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, to orthodoxy. She bluntly wrote that it was the most suitable eradication of the Uniate faith. Cruel and thoughtless. Protests were expected, of course, but she ordered that any disorder and trouble be averted and that none of the permanent or temporary landowners or spiritual and civil officials of the Roman and Uniate faith dare to cause even the smallest hindrance, oppression, or offense to those who are converting to orthodoxy. After Russia's victory against the Polish during the November Uprising from 1830 to 1831, the imperial government created a special body known as Committee on the Western Provinces, or Western Committee. Their goal was to integrate the new Ukrainian provinces into the empire, continuing the Russification that Catherine inflicted against the Hetmanut. Faith and language were big targets. Under the orders of Alexei Arlov, the head of the third section of the Imperial Chancellery, the institution responsible for political surveillance, Nikolai Kustomarv and Taras Shevchenko were arrested back in 1847. The third section's investigation of these two uncovered the secret organization called the Brotherhood of St. Cyril and Methodius. Their goal was the creation of a federation of Slavic nations with Ukraine as its leader. Arlov used the books of the genesis of the Ukrainian people as evidence, a treatise attributed to Kustomarv. Kustomarv characterized the Ukrainians as distinct from Russians and Poles. He believed that they are destined to lead the future Slavic Federation. He accused the Russians of being dominated by an autocratic czar, while Poles were corrupted by a caste of noble landowners. But the Ukrainians, he said, were a nation tied to their democratic Cossack traditions. The Cossack Brotherhood. Free men. Orlov called the members of the Brotherhood Ukrainophiles. He pushed for their imprisonment, exile, and forced military service. The third section released a memorandum through the Minister of Popular Education to warn all those dealing with Slavdom that in their books and lectures, they sedulously avoid any mention of Little Russia, Poland, and other lands subject to Russia that may be understood, in a sense, dangerous to the integrity and peace of the empire. In 1863, Minister of Internal Affairs Pyotr Valuev issued the secret decree called the Valuev Circular. It censored Ukrainian publications. Valuev wrote, There has never been, is not, and cannot be any separate Little Russian language, the so-called Ukrainian language. In 1875, Tsar Alexander II created a special council to investigate Ukrainian literature and the activities of the Ukrainophiles. In 1876, the council deliberated, allowing the creation of a separate popular literature in the Ukrainian dialect would mean establishing a firm basis for the development of the conviction that the alienation of Ukraine from Russia might be possible in the future. In response, Alexander II signed a decree known as the Edict of Ems or Ems-Ukaz. 
It banned the importation of all Ukrainian publications into the empire, unless it was for reprinting old documents. It removed existing Ukrainian publications from school and prevented theatrical performances, songs, and poetry readings in Ukrainian. Ukrainophiles were exiled. Potential Ukrainophiles were watched over. But Ukrainian independence was achieved even just for a brief time. The conflict between the Russian unifiers and the Ukrainophiles continued to the beginning of the 20th century. But after the February Revolution in 1917 that led to the downfall of the Russian monarchy, the Ukrainian People's Republic declared full independence. Unfortunately, several entities were looking to become independent Ukrainian states. Factions competed for power in a brutal civil war. From the Ukrainian nationalists, anarchists, Bolsheviks, the forces of Germany and Austria-Hungary, the White Russian Volunteer Army, to the Second Polish Republic forces. The independence ended up being short-lived. Most of Ukrainian lands were dragged into the Soviet Union in 1922. The rest in Western Ukraine were divided among Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Romania. Russification continued. Those who resisted were threatened. The usual tactics. Vladimir Lenin was willing to make concessions on language and culture, but he opposed Ukrainian independence hoping instead for the voluntary union of the Ukrainian people. Lenin believed that the biggest threat to the Soviet Union was not local nationalism, such as in Ukraine, but rather the great Russian nationalism. When Joseph Stalin rose to power to the point that he didn't need to make cultural concessions with Ukraine, he became more antagonistic against Ukrainization. Members of the Ukrainian intelligentsia, who are alleged nationalists, were persecuted in a highly publicized show trial. They were sentenced to forced labor camps and imprisonment. Mihailo Khrushchevsky, founder of the Central Rada, the All-Ukrainian Central Council of Ukraine, and leader of the Ukrainian Revolution, was exiled in 1931 and died under suspicious circumstances in Russia in 1934. The Palette Bureau, the principal policy-making committee of the Soviet Union, curtailed the development of national consciousness amongst Ukrainians, even outside Soviet Ukraine. The Russification of the Ukrainians pushed forth at a rate the Imperial Russia would envy. The Holodomor, or the Great Famine of 1932 to 1933, killed millions of Ukrainians, subduing Ukrainian nationalism even more. Whether it was a genocide or not is still up for debate. Intent on the part of the Soviet Union has never been unearthed, but it has been universally agreed upon that its origins were man-made. This could mean the death of millions. Who in the world will know? During his speech at the 17th Party Congress in 1934, Stalin said, In Ukraine, even quite recently, the deviation toward Ukrainian nationalism did not represent the main danger. But when people ceased to struggle against it and allowed it to develop to such an extent that it closed ranks with the interventionists, that deviation became the main danger. <laughs> During the years leading up to World War II, the Great Purge was set in motion. It was Stalin's campaign to consolidate his power over the party and the nation. He feared losing his unsteady position and the growing threat of fascism in the West. Potential traitors, from high-ranking Communist Party officials to ordinary citizens, were exterminated. Political dissent in Ukraine was one of Stalin's targets. Many were sent to the Gulag, the Soviet labor camps. Many were murdered. In 1938, under Nikita Khrushchev, then secretary of the Ukrainian Communist Party, Russification was intensified. On the 29th of June 1941, the Nazi expansionism of Germany reached Ukraine. Almost 4 million Ukrainians were evacuated to the east. But some older Ukrainians missed their former Austrian rulers while some younger Ukrainians resented the Holodomor and hoped that the Nazis could help them establish an independent Ukraine. The Nazis pretended to back that wish only to pull the rug once they invaded. By the fall of 1941, the Red Army, comprised of some Ukrainians, some being victims of the famine, could not stop the Nazi invasion of Ukraine. 
The occupation killed an estimated 900,000 to 1.6 million Jews and 3 to 4 million non-Jewish Ukrainians. On the 2nd of February 1943, the Soviet Union won against the Nazis during the Battle of Stalingrad. Kiev was retaken. By the 28th of October 1944, Western Ukraine was liberated. Ukraine was again under the hands of the Soviet Union. From the 18th to 20th May 1944, Stalin and the head of the Soviet State Security and Secret Police, Lavrienti Beria, deported the Crimean Tatars, partly as collective punishment for their alleged collaboration with the Nazis. It was an ethnic cleansing, a genocide. Beginning in 1946, resolutions were once again passed to combat Ukrainian nationalism. On the 4th of April 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, was formed in the aftermath of World War II. It served as an agreement for collective security, originally between Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the United Kingdom, and the United States. It was formed during the Cold War in response to the Soviet Union. According to NATO's Article 5, an attack on one is an attack on all. On the 18th and 20th of February 1952, NATO included Greece and Turkey respectively into the alliance. When West Germany joined NATO on the 6th of May 1955, the Soviet Union established the Warsaw Pact in response. Acting as a counter to NATO, the pact served as an agreement for collective security between the Soviet Union and seven other Eastern Bloc Socialist republics of Central and Eastern Europe. Nikita Khrushchev stepped into power as the new first secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union on the 14th of September 1953. Lavrienti Beria attempted to push back on the Russification of ethnic minorities, but he was executed for treason, among other offenses, the same year. In 1954, Khrushchev celebrated the 300th anniversary of the Pereslav Agreement of 1654, commemorating the allegiance of the Ukrainian Cossacks to the Tsar of Russia. Soviet propaganda considered this as an act of reunification of Ukraine with Russia. There must be more contacts. More contacts between our peoples. The anniversary even saw the Russian Soviet Republic returning Crimea to the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. To Khrushchev, it was a gift to his adopted country where he once ruled, an act to strengthen the brotherly ties between the Ukrainian and Russian people. Both Russia and Ukraine were parts of the Soviet Union, so the transfer didn't hold that much significance. In October 1961, during the 22nd Party Congress, Khrushchev declared, the present generation of Soviet people will live under communism, a new historical community of people of various nationalities with common characteristics, the Soviet people, has taken shape in the USSR. Khrushchev once declared, and we quote, the sooner we all speak Russian, the more quickly we shall build communism. And to bring about peaceful coexistence uh, between countries with a different system. Cultural Russification continued under Leonid Brezhnev when he stepped into power on the 14th of October 1964. The idea of building one Soviet nation continued. The party was somewhat content with moderate Russian nationalism. However, they strongly opposed non-Russian nationalism in the republics. This included Ukraine. First Secretary of the Communist Party of Ukraine, Pietro Shelest, was dismissed on the 19th of May 1972. His idealization of the Ukrainian Cossackdom and support of Ukrainian culture and identity were not taken well. Dissidents pushing for the revival of national consciousness in Ukraine were arrested and thrown into the Gulag. The Ukrainian Helsinki Group was founded on the 9th of November 1976. They sought to protect human rights in Ukraine. It was inspired by the Helsinki Accords of 1975, which was meant to ease the tensions between the East and the West. Our joint efforts must help mankind win a durable peace. The Soviet authorities were obviously not happy. In 1977, the group adopted a document that read, why should Ukraine's cultural, creative, scientific, agricultural, and international problems be defined and planned in the capital of a neighboring state? Most of the Helsinki members met their fate in the Gulag. 
But after the unsuccessful 1991 coup against Mikhail Gorbachev from the 19th to the 22nd of August of that year, the Soviet Union eventually faced disillusion. Rada, or the Parliament of Ukraine, immediately declared its independence on the 24th of August 1991. The government wants a whole country, which is practically 100% state-owned, to be liberalized overnight. Boris Yeltsin, the first president of the Russian Federation, threatened to revise the borders and claim parts of Ukraine if they push for independence. He sent a delegation to the country, but they were booed by protesters in Kiev at the mere mention of Russo-Ukrainian unity. I'm emotional. I take everything that happens very much to heart, especially if anything doesn't work. On the 1st of December 1991, the referendum on the act of declaration of independence in Ukraine received an overwhelming 92.3% approval from the voters. With a turnout of 84.2%, Leonid Kravchuk was elected as the first president of Ukraine. On the 8th of December 1991, the Belovesh Accords were signed. It was an agreement that formalized the dissolution of the Soviet Union. It was succeeded by the Commonwealth of Independent States, an intergovernmental organization that declared all members as sovereign and independent nations. When the Soviet Union dissolved, Ukraine held about one-third of the Soviet nuclear arsenal, the third largest in the world at that time. They also possessed the capability to produce more, but the software to utilize them was in Russia's hands. On the 5th of December 1994, the Budapest Memorandum was signed. Originally by the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom, and the United States, it provided Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan security assurances against the signatories under the condition that they give up their nuclear weapons. Ukraine agreed. They transferred their weapons to Russia and joined the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, or NPT, which, as the name suggests, was an international treaty that sought to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and achieve nuclear disarmament. Russia has obviously not assured any security today. On the 25th of February 1991, the Warsaw Pact was disbanded. Countries such as Hungary, Poland, and Czechoslovakia have been clamoring to withdraw. But NATO, on the other hand, continued its expansion, as it did back on the 30th of May 1982 when Spain joined the alliance. The following decade saw the Warsaw Pact countries switching sides to NATO. The West denied that there was ever a deal about not pushing for NATO expansionism, but memos and transcripts from the U.S. archives told a different story. In early February 1990, the U.S. made an offer to the Soviet Union. Then Secretary of State James Baker suggested that if the Soviet Union cooperated on Germany's Western alignment, the U.S. would guarantee that NATO would not expand one inch eastward. Less than a week later, Gorbachev agreed. There was no formal deal signed though. Perhaps an agreement like that should have been written down. You may not humiliate a nation, a people, and think that uh, it'll have no consequences. By the next month, the U.S. was already contemplating pulling Eastern Europe into their sphere. But on the 18th of May 1990, Baker still promised the Soviet Union that the U.S. would cooperate with them in the development of a new Europe. Russian reactions to possible NATO expansion went back and forth back in the 1990s. Yeltsin visited Poland back on the 26th of August 1993 and told Polish President Lech Wałęsa that they do not oppose their membership in NATO. That was retracted immediately the following month. Opposition in Russia was just too strong. In October of that same year, Yeltsin wrote that the expansion violated the 1990 agreement with Baker. <laughs> But on the 22nd of June 1994, Russia became the first country to join NATO's Partnership for Peace, a bilateral cooperation between the alliance and partner countries. On the 27th of May 1997, NATO and Boris Yeltsin signed the NATO-Russia Founding Act that sought to keep peace in the Euro-Atlantic area. But according to the conditions, the act stated, the member states of NATO reiterate that they have no intention, no plan, and no reason to deploy nuclear weapons on the territory of new members. Russia has walked away from the NATO-Russia Funding Act. 
But a year before, back on the 22nd of October 1996, U.S. President Bill Clinton hollered at former Warsaw Pact countries and post-Soviet republics to join NATO. At the 1999 Washington Summit, the 16th NATO Summit, back on the 23rd to the 25th of April, during the 50th anniversary of the Western Military Alliance, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic officially joined NATO. The first group of countries we invite to join should be full-fledged members of NATO. Bill Clinton declared that, and we quote, A gray zone of insecurity must not re-emerge in Europe. It will advance the security of everyone, NATO's old members, new members, and non-members alike. No country outside NATO will have a veto. Clinton urged Russia to stop viewing NATO through a Cold War prism. But it was not speculation that the U.S. had intended to keep its supremacy status and push away any other nations that would threaten to topple it. An initial version of the defense planning guidance for the 1994 to 1999 fiscal years was leaked to the New York Times on the 12th of March 1992. It was unofficially called the Wolfowitz Doctrine. Named after its main publisher, U.S. Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Paul Wolfowitz. The doctrine was flagrantly imperialist. On the 16th of April 1992, a rewritten version of the document was officially released under the close supervision of U.S. Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Colin Powell. The doctrine arrogantly announced, Our first objective is to prevent the re-emergence of a new rival, either on the territory of the former Soviet Union or elsewhere, that poses a threat on the order of that posed formerly by the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, a semblance of peace with the former Soviet Union could have been a possibility as seen in a BBC interview back on the 6th of March 2000. Talking to interviewer David Frost, then acting Russian President Vladimir Putin, had said about Russia's possible membership in NATO, Why not? I do not rule out such a possibility. Russia is a part of European culture, and I do not consider my own country in isolation from Europe. Therefore, it is with difficulty that I imagine NATO as an enemy. Communist Party leader Gennady Zuganov, a presidential candidate, called him naive, saying that he lacked understanding of foreign policy issues. The chance of a new and healthier relationship between the U.S. and Russia grew stronger in the aftermath of the September 11 attacks. Putin was one of the first foreign leaders to give support to then-President George Bush. The conversation was not only about condolences, it was an offer of concrete policies to combat terrorism, a new level of military cooperation between the two former enemies. As a side note, the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks was the only time NATO's Article 5 was executed. Let us hope that it won't be used any time again soon. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On the 28th of May 2002, Putin and NATO signed a declaration entitled NATO-Russia Relations, a new quality, establishing the NATO-Russia Council. It was meant for collaboration for counterterrorism and military cooperation, in particular, a cooperation in Afghanistan. During the 2002 Prague Summit, held from the 21st to 22nd of November 2002, another NATO expansion was in the talks. The Central and Eastern European countries, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia were invited. At the 2004 Istanbul summit held from the 28th to 29th of June 2004, these seven countries officially joined the alliance. NATO still kept on expanding. From November 2004 to January 2005, a series of protests called the Orange Revolution rocked Ukraine. The 2004 Ukrainian presidential election between leading candidates pro-Ukrainian Viktor Yushchenko and pro-Russian Viktor Yanukovych was said to have been rigged with corruption in favor of Yanukovych. Most of the Russian speakers in the East voted for Yanukovych, while the Ukrainian speakers in the West voted for Yushchenko. A revote was ordered. Yushchenko proved victorious. On the 23rd of January 2005, Yushchenko was declared the winner and the revolution ended. The 
є та середньовічна феодальна політика, з якою живе Росія в 21-му столітті. During the 2008 Bucharest summit held from the 2nd to the 4th of April 2008, Croatia and Albania were invited to join NATO. The two ultimately joined the next year on the 1st of April 2009, two days before the 2009 Strasbourg Kiel summit. Another set of countries was added to the alliance. Two more countries with significance were knocking at the alliance's doors. Georgia and Ukraine look forward to becoming a member, but NATO decided not to invite them in. NATO Secretary General Yap de Hope Skeffer still promised that the two would become members eventually. We need to develop in NATO a new strategic concept. Germany and France oppose their inclusion, citing Russia's concerns about NATO's eastward expansion. Russia's Deputy Foreign Minister Alexander Grushko has said, and we quote, Georgia's and Ukraine's membership in the alliance is a huge strategic mistake, which would have most serious consequences for pan-European security. Russian President Vladimir Putin cautioned NATO that their expansion to the east would be taken in Russia as a direct threat to the security of our country. His former kindness has now been overturned. He appealed to the West to consider his country's security concerns. He said, let's be friends, guys. Let's be frank and open. Invasion of Georgia began not long after, with the aim of blocking the country's entry to NATO and enforcing a regime change in it. On the 1st of August 2008, the first European war of the 21st century struck. Russia and the Russian-backed self-proclaimed republics of South Ossetia and Acacia waged war with Georgia. Seven days later, on the 8th of August 2008, Russia accused Georgia of aggression against South Ossetia. A full-scale invasion was launched onto Georgia, with Russia referring to it as a peace enforcement operation. They always had a way of not saying war. The Georgian crisis greatly damaged Russia and NATO's relationship. On the 4th of April 2009, NATO acknowledged their disagreements with Russia over Georgia, but decided to continue their cooperation. Two years before, on the 22nd of July 2008, a stabilization and association type agreement was on the way between Ukraine and the European Union. But under these type of agreements, Ukraine could only enter the EU deal if it could commit to the required reforms. On the 5th of September 2011, Catherine Ashton, the European Union High Representative for Foreign Affairs, warned Ukraine that ratification could only push through if they reversed their approach to the trial of former Prime Minister of Ukraine, Yulia Tymoshenko. The European Union is really disappointed with the verdict that's come out of Ukraine in the case of Yulia Tymoshenko. She was sentenced to seven years in prison on the 11th of October 2011 for abuse of office after she brokered what was considered an overpriced 2009 gas deal with Russia. The whole verdict was deemed as political persecution. Timoshenka co-led the Orange Revolution that had ousted Yanukovych back in 2004. Yanukovych was elected president in 2010, defeating her in the elections and regaining his loss from the Orange Revolution. Now for some political revenge, he had her arrested. I would engage in a different kind of politics to the one deployed by the present government. But back in December 2011, Timoshenko herself, with the aid of her daughter, Eugenia Timoshenko, asked the EU to sign the deal, saying that her imprisonment should not stop the agreement. On the 10th of December 2012, the EU Foreign Affairs Council released a statement that the association agreement would pull through as soon as Ukraine worked on the reforms. On the 22nd of February 2013, a resolution in Ukraine was approved that ensured that these recommendations would be implemented. Three days later on the 25th, Yanukovych declared that Ukraine would do its best to meet EU's requirements. But at the same time, he was also in negotiations with Russia for the possibility of cooperation between Ukraine, Russia and the EU. I believe that Ukraine needs to be a dependable partner both for the European Union and for Russia. The president of the European Commission, José Manuel Barroso, frankly contended that Ukraine cannot have both. He said, and we quote, one country cannot at the same time be a member of a customs union and be in a deep common free trade area with the European Union. This is not possible. On the 3rd of September 2013, Yanukovych urges Parliament, the Verhovna Rada, to adopt the laws required in order for Ukraine to meet the EU's criteria so they could sign the association agreement on the 29th of November 2013. By the 21st of November 2013, 
The parliament failed to pass any of the six motions that would allow Timoshenko to receive medical treatment abroad. On that same day, a decree proposed instead the creation of a three-way trade commission between Ukraine, Russia and the EU. The Russian presidential press secretary, Dmitry Peskov, stated that Russia was fine with having tripartite negotiations with Ukraine and the EU. Still, on the same day, Yanukovych stated that an alternative for reforms in Ukraine and an alternative for European integration do not exist. We are walking along this path and are not changing direction. The door is open. We'll discuss matters of concern that Ukraine may have and we are ready to discuss them with Ukraine, with Russia or whatever country. On the very same day, because of the sudden decision to switch from the European Union-Ukraine Association Agreement to Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union, large protests in the Maidan Nezalezhnosti, or the Independent Square in Kiev, collectively called Euromaidan, began to build up. These were the largest protests in Ukraine since the Orange Revolution. But unlike the 2004 protests, Euromaidan proved to be deadlier. 130 people died. On the 26th of November 2013, Yanukovych said, As soon as we reach a level that is comfortable for us, when it meets our interests, when we agree on normal terms, then we will be talking about signing. On the same day, Putin called for an end to the criticism of Ukraine's decision and said that the EU deal was a threat to Russia's economy and security. Our partners in the United States are not trying to hide the fact that they supported those opposed to President Yanukovych. Yanukovych still attended the EU summit held from the 28th to the 29th of November. He stated that Ukraine still wanted to sign the deal, but that they required financial aid to compensate for Russia's threatened response. Proposing once again to start three-way talks between Ukraine, Russia and the EU, the EU rejected it. After the summit, Mr. Barroso said, We will not give in to external pressure, not the least from Russia. Back on the 4th of September 2013, Yanukovych estimated that he would need 160 billion US dollars over three years to recoup the cost of losing Ukraine's trade with Russia and for the reforms that EU demanded. The EU refused the amount, which they said was exaggerated, offering only 839 million US dollars instead. On the 17th of December 2013, Putin took the opportunity to provide 15 billion US dollars in loans and steep discounts on natural gas prices. Opposition parties coordinating the Euromaidan protest were suspicious about what Yanukovych had offered in exchange for the bailout. Putin clarified, and we quote, I want to calm everyone down. Today we did not discuss the question of Ukraine's accession to the customs union. Yanukovych praised him back, saying, I know that this work wouldn't have been done at this optimal speed if not for the Russian president's political will. By a Ukrainian parliament majority vote, Yanukovych was removed on the 22nd of February 2014 and was replaced by a new interim government. Before the end of the day, Timoshenko was released from prison. By the 27th of June 2014, the EU and the new Ukrainian president Petro Poroshenko signed the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement. And Russian presence in Crimea, in the east of Ukraine, in Syria, in Transnistria, in Ossetia, in Abkhazia, in everywhere. That's create a point of instability. He declared, tell me please, who after this will dare close the door of Europe to Ukraine? Who will be against the perspective of membership in the EU, towards which we are taking today our first but most decisive step? And I think this is one of the most historic days <coughs> after getting the independence. President of the European Council, Herman van Rompuy, paid tributes to those who died, saying, in Kiev and elsewhere, people gave their lives for this closer link to the European Union. We will not forget this. But Putin asserted that making Ukraine choose between Russia and the EU would split the already divided country into two. Russia did not only oppose NATO's expansion, but also of EU. Yanukovych said about the Euromaidan protest back on the 22nd of February, I am completely sure that this is an example that our country and the whole world saw, an example of a coup d'etat. On the 23rd of February 2014, a callback to the language laws of Ukrainian history was made. There was a move to have a bill to repeal the 2012 law on the principles of the state language policy. 
which granted Russian the status of a regional language. The bill would have placed Ukrainian as the sole state language at all levels and regulated the use of minority languages including Russian. Four years later, on the 28th of February 2018, the 2012 law was ruled unconstitutional. Ukraine just reversed the language laws that began with Catherine the Great. A bit of an infamous scandal flared up during the Euromaidan protest. Then Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs at the U.S. Department of State, Victoria Newland, acted as the lead diplomat on the Ukraine crisis. Back on the 4th of February 2014, a phone call made between her and the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Payet, on the 28th of January 2014 was leaked. The conversation revealed that the U.S. was potentially much more involved in trying to orchestrate a deal in Ukraine. Newland and Payet discussed which of the three opposition candidates should become the Prime Minister of Ukraine. Upon review, Newland notified Payet that the U.S. State Department selected Arseniy Yatsenyuk. Yatsenyuk officially became the Prime Minister of Ukraine on the 27th of February 2014. They also expressed frustration on the EU's indecisiveness in dealing with Russia, with Newland being heard saying, the EU. Then Department of State spokesperson Jen Psaki argued that the phone call was not evidence of American interference in Ukraine and that it was an innocent discussion of what was happening in the embattled country. While the signing of the EU deal went on, Crimea was breaking away from Ukraine to return back to Russia. Putin openly admitted his plans on taking Crimea. He had a meeting with officials from the 22nd to the 23rd of February, talking about rescuing the deposed Yanukovych. He said during that meeting, we must start working on returning Crimea to Russia. Four days after, on the 27th of February, masked Russian troops took over the Crimean parliament and captured strategic sites across the region. They waved the Russian flag. On that day, pro-Russian Sergei Akshinov was forcibly installed as the de facto leader of Crimea. Putin recognized him as the legitimate leader of Crimea, even though he has never met him. Back in late January, as the Euromaidan grew stronger in Kiev, Akshinov was already building an army in the annex region. On the 16th of March 2014, a referendum was asked to the local Crimeans whether they wanted to return to Russia or to the 1992 Crimean constitution and be a part of Ukraine. The official results showed a 97% vote in favor of integrating into the Russian Federation. On the 18th, Crimea was officially incorporated into the Russian Federation. Keeping the current status quo was not an available choice. Many have argued that both choices would have just resulted in the de facto separation of Crimea. The Russian troops enveloping the region obviously did not help. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has responded about possible retaliation on the annexations, saying, We have the doctrine of national security, and it very clearly regulates the actions which will be taken in this case. Uh. We don't like uh, anybody. This was an implicit threat to use nuclear weapons to keep Crimea on their hands. It was stated in their military doctrine issued in 2010. The Russian Federation reserves the right to utilize nuclear weapons in response to the utilization of nuclear and other types of weapons of mass destruction against it and or its allies. Many countries, including Ukraine, condemn the annexation as not only a violation of international law, but also of the agreement signed by Ukraine and Russia for the former's territorial integrity, from the Belovesh Accords, to the Helsinki Accords, to the Budapest Memorandum. Putin rejected the label of annexation, arguing instead that the referendum complied with the principle of self-determination. Gorbachev praised Crimea's separation from Ukraine, arguing that when Crimea was transferred from Russia to Ukraine back in 1954, the Crimeans did not have a say on it. But during this 2014 referendum, they had. His comments led to his ban from Ukraine for five years. On the 1st of April 2014, NATO suspended all practical cooperation with Russia after the annexation of Crimea. The NATO-Russia Council was not suspended, but NATO still strengthened its defense of Ukraine. With the eastern part of Ukraine's support for Russia, it did not take long before the Donbass region or the southeastern part of Ukraine imitated what happened in Crimea right after the Euromaidan protests. On the 1st to 6th of March 2014, armed Kremlin-backed separatist groups occupied the Donetsk government headquarters. By the end, 70 people were taken into custody. But on the 6th of April, around 1,000 to 2,000 people stormed the building once again, demanding a status referendum similar to the one held in Crimea last month. 
On the same day, around a thousand people infiltrated the security service building in Luhansk, demanding a similar status referendum. The next day, the Donetsk People Republic was proclaimed. On the 27th of April 2014, the Luhansk People Republic followed. The referendums took place on the 11th of May 2014. 89% of voters in the Donetsk region and 97.5% in the neighboring Luhansk voted in their favor. But they did not have any independent verification. According to the Luhansk People's Republic, the turnout was 75%, but Ukrainian Ministry of Internal Affairs told that it was only 24%. Donetsk People's Republic said they had 75%, but Ukraine said it was only 32%. Strings of uprising have also occurred in other regions such as Kharkiv and Mariupol, but they did not experience the same success as Luhansk and Donetsk. It was a fair referendum. No one was holding a pistol to their head. They freely expressed their will. The number of casualties has been difficult to verify, but estimates said that over 4,600 soldiers have been killed on the Ukrainian side as of February 2022. Almost 5,800 soldiers have been killed on the side of the LPR and DPR as of February 2022. And overall, estimates stated that about 14,000 people have been killed as of May 2021. Something that has marred the reputation of Ukraine during the Russo-Ukrainian War was the rise of neo-Nazis. During the Donbass War of 2014, a paramilitary group infiltrated by neo-Nazis emerged to battle the Russian separatist groups in the region, the Azov Battalion. Putin's claims that he was denazifying Ukraine most likely stemmed from this. And what has given this justification too much credence was the fact that the Azov Battalion has been incorporated into the National Guard of Ukraine since the 11th of November 2014. Post Euromaidan, Ukraine has been the only country in the world to have a neo-Nazi battalion in its armed forces. Then President Petro Poroshenko complimented the regiment, saying, These are our best warriors, our best volunteers. The Office of the United High Commissioner for Human Rights has accused the group of partaking in torture and other war crimes. The U.S. banned military aid to Azov for their white supremacist ideology back in March 2018, fixing the overturn of a similar ban back in December 2015. The battalion has also been alleged to have been privately funded by Ihor Kolomoisky, a Ukrainian oligarch. Kolomoisky owns 70% of the One Plus One media group whose TV channel One Plus One aired Servant of the People, the comedy series in which now Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky played the role of the President of Ukraine. He played Vasily Petrovich Goloborodko, a high school history teacher who was unexpectedly elected as the President of Ukraine after he went viral for a video where he ranted against the corruption in his country. A president the Pandora Papers, documents that leaked the secret offshore accounts of world leaders, revealed that Zelensky has been linked to a network of offshore firms dating back to at least 2012, a complete opposite to the character he played in Servant of the People. Kolomoisky has also been thrown with allegations of multi-billion dollar fraud. He has reportedly financed much of Zelensky's campaign for the presidency. Poroshenko, Zelensky's opponent in the elections and an enemy of Kolomoisky, accused Zelensky of being Kolomoisky's puppet. Звертаюсь до Петра Порошенко. Ви кличете мене на дебати. Мрія лише я втечу, відморожусь, заховаюсь. Ні. This dubious connection has been used to tie Zelensky into neo-Nazism, even though he himself is a Jew and his ancestors were killed during the Holocaust. But perhaps to temper Putin's claim of Nazism against Ukraine, a spokesman from the battalion contended that only around 10 to 20 percent of them were Nazis. The battalion might not be the source to confirm whether they were Nazis or not. Regardless, by 2022, the regiment only had around 900 members. So the power that they have might not be as concerning as Putin claimed them to be. Jump to the war in 2022. The Azov Battalion has been battling against the Russian invaders. The Azov Battalion, uh, it has to be said, probably not, not the whole battalion or it's now a detachment, it's now on, on the, in the National Guard as a detachment, is, is not neo-Nazi. That I, I don't want to say this. Controversial paramilitary groups have emerged during the Euromaidan revolts other than the Azov Battalion. There is the neo-Nazi right sector, 
Then there was the Tornado Battalion, whose members were mostly former convicts accused of looting, rape, and torture. Regardless of these issues, the whole idea of denazification comes across as just a flimsy pretext for war. On the 5th of September 2014, international agreements were made in an effort to end the war in the Donbass region. These were referred to as the Minsk Agreements. They unfortunately did not help to stop the fighting. The format of the Minsk agreement isn't sufficient, and that's mostly because of the non-constructive positions taken by Ukrainian authorities. An updated agreement was made on the 12th of February 2015, referred to as the Minsk II. A ceasefire was asked, a withdrawal of heavy weapons out of the front line, the release of prisoners of war, and even a constitutional reform in Ukraine that would grant independence in certain areas of Donbass and the restoration of control of the state border to Ukraine. Some of the fighting waned, but it never really ended. As we all know now, it only escalated even further. At the Warsaw summit back on the 8th to the 9th of July 2016, NATO demanded that Russia comply with the international laws or else their cooperation would be kept suspended. On the 18th of February 2017, Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs Sergei Lavrov stated that he still supported resuming military cooperation with NATO. On the 5th of June 2017, another country, Montenegro, officially joined NATO, enlarging the alliance even further. On the 21st of April 2019, comedian Volodymyr Zelensky, a political novice, won the Ukrainian presidency by a landslide. He had said about the separatists fighting with Ukrainian forces in the east, I think that we will have personal changes. In any case, we will continue in the direction of the Minsk talks and head towards concluding a ceasefire. The radical right groups allegedly threatened him with a coup and even death if he so much as attempted to negotiate with the pro-Russian separatists from the Donbass region and betray the successes of the Euromaidan protests. So with those threats, Zelensky dismissed the separatists instead as terrorists. On the 27th of March 2020, another country, the 30th ally, North Macedonia, officially joined NATO. On the 16th of December 2020, the UN General Assembly adopted the Russian resolution entitled Combating Glorification of Nazism, Neo-Nazism, and Other Practices that Contribute to Fueling Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance. Two countries explicitly voted against it, United States and Ukraine. Make of that what you will. The argument? It infringed on freedom of expression to an unacceptable degree. The resolution was accused as an attempt to legitimize Russian disinformation that denigrated Ukraine under the guise of fighting Nazi glorification. On the 6th of October 2021, NATO expelled eight Russian officials, accusing them of secretly working as intelligent officers. By the 19th of October, Russia suspended its mission to NATO and closed the alliance's office in Moscow. No government has officially recognized the separatist referendums from the Donbass region until the 21st of February 2022, when Russia acknowledged their independence, shortly before sending troops to conduct peacekeeping operations there. The next day, on the 22nd of February, Putin declared the Minsk agreements null and blamed Ukraine for the conflict. Two days later, on the 24th of February 2022, they launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, or as Putin would say, a special military operation. As of 2022, NATO has its arms open to Bosnia and Herzegovina, Georgia, and most significantly, the main point of contention, Ukraine. I really hope that you and President Putin get together and can solve your problem. That would be a tremendous achievement. And I know you're trying to do that. This entire history we had just explored highlighted how Russia and the West have been pulling Ukraine from left to right. As we have seen through the centuries, it has not been at all surprising why Russia has always had concerns about its security against Western expansionism. Back in 1610, there was the Polish invasion of Russia. In 1708, there was the Swedish invasion. In 1812, Napoleon ran through Russia. Then there were two world wars of the 20th century. Why did NATO keep expanding, an alliance that was explicitly to counter the Soviet Union? The Warsaw Pact was created in response to NATO, not the other way around. It was peacefully dissolved when the Soviet Union was no more. But why was NATO still expanding, even more so in Russia's backyard? 
Back on the 10th of March 2007, during the Munich Security Conference, Putin put forth one of his most clear warnings against NATO's expansionism, saying, we quote, and we have the right to ask, against whom is this expansion intended? And what happened to the assurances our Western partners made after the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact? Putin made another speech on the same vein on the 24th of October 2014 during the Valdai International Discussion Club. He stated, in a situation where you had domination by one country and its allies, or its satellites rather, the search for global solutions often turned into an attempt to impose their own universal recipes. At the 70th session of the UN General Assembly back on the 28th of September 2015, Putin brought up Ukraine and the West interference. He asserted, they have not turned their back on policies based on self-certainty, a sense of superiority and impunity. During a policy talk at the Valdai Discussion Club on the 19th of October 2021, Putin dialed up his anti-West rhetoric, saying, and we quote, Our biggest mistake was that we trusted you too much. You interpreted our trust as weakness, and you exploited that. During a press conference back on the 23rd of December 2021, when asked a question about what the West does not understand about Russia and his intentions, Putin responded, The U.S. is parking missiles on the porch of our house. We could give a what about the argument by bringing up the Cuban Missile Crisis that lasted from the 16th of October to the 20th of November 1962. A confrontation between the U.S. and the Soviet Union escalated. When the U.S. deployed ballistic missiles in Italy and Turkey, Soviet did not hesitate to match it by deploying similar missiles in Cuba, a country one could argue was the port of the U.S. Cuba requested to have nuclear missiles to deter another invasion, like the failed Bay of Pigs invasion of 1961 by Cuban exiles that opposed Fidel Castro's communist Cuban revolution. This invasion was proven to have been covertly financed by the U.S. This whole missile crisis was the closest the Cold War came to an all-out nuclear war. It has been a travesty that less than a century later, the possibility of a nuclear war has once again become a discussion. Smart. Death. Just death. And the U.S. might not have acted that differently if they were in the same position as Russia. Besides the explicit evidence for imperialism of the Wolfowitz Doctrine and Victoria Newland's leaked phone call, the U.S. foreign policy has this thing called the Monroe Doctrine. President James Monroe first articulated this way back on the 2nd of December 1823, during his 7th annual State of the Union address. The policy basically stated that the country opposed any sort of European colonialism in the Western Hemisphere, to the point that any outside intervention in the political affairs of the Americas could be deemed as hostile to the U.S. Exactly what the Cuban Missile Crisis was about. Ukraine was Russia's backyard. The Western Hemisphere was the U.S.'s backyard. At the time of this writing, Zelensky has stated that Ukraine was now ready to consider neutrality during peace talks with Russia. But the initial peace talks ended without breakthrough. Zelensky has now reconsidered his initial plea to enter the NATO alliance. Ukraine cannot continue being pulled left to right by Russia and the West. Russia's sentimental relations with Ukraine have always been forced, and the West expansion to Ukraine has always been taken as a provocation. It might very well be in the best interest, not only for Ukraine, but for Russia and the West too, if Ukraine could just act as a buffer state between the two and end the push for expansion. This might have been easier said before the war struck though. Putin is currently warning against foreign intervention in Ukraine, which its citizens has been desperately begging for. Russia has now been attacking the capital of Kiev. Let us hope that someday, Ukraine could have the freedom to decide their own path moving forward, unconstrained by the interests of the superpowers that have long plagued the country. Slava Ukraine! Это серьезная такой, на самом деле, серьезная вещь, которая составляет, наверное, суть преимуществ демократии. И именно поэтому, ну не только поэтому, но в том числе и поэтому, демократии, демократии являются более жизнеспособными и более эффективными.